Chris Lee and Blaine Gilmer of Southeastern 14. We are continuing our preview series for 2023 in football for the SEC. Today, we get to the South Carolina Gamecocks. We had a super interesting season. You're kind of going nowhere, and I see him in Nashville. Wasn't that impressed in person. Lo and behold, a couple weeks later, the Gamecocks knock off Tennessee. They wreck Clemson. Thought they were going to do it to Notre Dame in the bowl game. That didn't happen. But we got all kinds of stuff, man. We got Carolina surviving injuries and transfers, and we got the return of Spencer Rattler. I feel like it's never dull in Columbia as long as Shane Beamer's been around. Yeah, Shane Beamer always providing uh, some some fun sound bites to go with. It's all kinds of good stuff over there with uh, with South Carolina. But definitely a roller coaster type year. You know, definitely seemed like – like early on when they just get their doors blown off by Georgia, that that was a, that was a deal that, you know, man, you're like, man, how far off is this program? But then at the end with the just overly impressive victories over Tennessee and Clemson, not, not just, I felt like they dominated those games for the most part, um, especially the Tennessee game. Yeah. Hanging 63, (laughs) hanging 63 points on, on them. I know Tennessee's defense, you know, you can say what you want, but you, you hang 63 on anybody. Um, and I think it, I, I heard a, a stat that I believe it was the most lopsided SEC game in, in history, like in terms of, in terms of just those, those two SEC teams. I definitely know that it was in South Carolina history. I heard a replay of their call in show after that game. So definitely Shane Beamer doing some big things, not only Chris doing big things on the field, but also uh, some recruiting momentum this offseason as well. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's look at the offensive side of the ball. Spencer Rattler's back. Uh, they lose Jaheim Bell and Austin Stogner. Stogner went back to Oklahoma. And that's weird. Um, lost three offensive linemen, Douglas, Gwynn, Wanham. Seemed like Wanham had been there a while, but they got a couple transfers. Running backs, they lost Lloyd and Jaheim Bell, but they got a couple of guys in. They lost Josh Fan to eligibility, but they get back Joyner, Leggett, Wells. That's a pretty good start. They get, what, a pretty good transfer from Western Kentucky and another one from Memphis, um, and they get Trey Knox yeah. from Arkansas, who's from my neck of the woods and I like a lot. Uh, my goodness, that's a lot of moving parts. How do we make sense of this? You know, everybody's going to point at, at Trey Knox, who's, of course, more well-known uh, in terms of what he was able to do at, at Arkansas and now coming, you know, staying in the SEC, and and especially with Stogner and Bell going out, that's a, that's a vital part. But, you know, Spencer Rattler coming back, the deal is, okay, can they get what they got out of Spencer Rattler late in the season? If so, it's not only going to help his draft – stock for the next year which a lot of us thought he was playing for this past year um but of course it's going to really help south carolina they're going to need to be able to to put up some points because there are some questions on the defensive side of the ball going into uh 2023 the offense is really going to be looked upon to be key um but you can't fault shane beamer's creativity chris because he's going to yale to western illinois to newberry college in division two and getting guys who were playmakers uh through the transfer portal to come in and and fill some gaps you got nick garugulo i think i pronounced that correctly don't not not don't hold me to the pronunciation but he's from yale uh offensive lineman coming in and sydney fugar coming in from western illinois those both coming in trying to replace the production and the experience of that trio that you said that's exiting and and Douglas Gwynn and Wanham. So it's it's never easy trying to replace guys up front, but Marshawn Lloyd was really, when healthy, one of the more violent, one of the more uh, just impressive running backs. And Mario Anderson Jr., as I mentioned, Newberry College, Division II school. He put up a ton of records in terms of Newberry College, but it is a – Chris, I would venture to say it's going to be a massive leap for that young man, uh, the competition he's going to face going from Newberry to the the likes of SEC and, then of course, Juju McDowell there. But impressive wide receiver core um, and the tight end addition in Trey Knox is there. And then, you know, we, we said we had to talk about – 
recruiting. Nichols Harbor is one of the biggest, most high-profile recruits that South Carolina has ever brought in. Tremendous speed, world-class speed, and is a guy that, you know, six foot five, 225 pounds, can play a hybrid wide receiver tight end type deal. So you add him to Trey Knox and those that uh, quartet of receivers that you said returning. Uh, potential for some – for some for some fireworks in the offense, and you also mentioned transfers. Joshua Simmons, six foot four, two thirty five, transfers in from Western Kentucky. Eddie Lewis, a speedster from Memphis, so added some weapons there for Spencer Rattler on offense. Defensively, uh, boy, it's a it's weird because they they bring back like a lot of their top players. By my count, I think they bring back what is it? Six of their seven leading tacklers from a year ago, but boy, you look at who they lose. They lose Cam Smith. They lose Darius Rush. They lose Zach Pickens. They lose Jordan Birch, who was the one of that seven in the tackle list that they lost. Yeah. But they got Nick Emmanuel, who was freshman All American, Shrod Green's back, DQ Smith, Brad Johnson, Marcellus Dial, Debo Williams. Uh, Tonka Hemingway's back. I mean, they, uh, they weren't great on defense a year ago. But I've seen a lot of SEC teams that were in worse shape in terms of what they had coming back, even with what they lost, and, and they lost some really good corners there in particular. Um, you, you could be in a lot worse shape in this era of the transfer portal. Uh, no doubt that they, they they lost a lot in terms of some guys that were big time production, and, and Birch, who was a was a heavily recruited guy that ended up ended up going there and then transferring away. But they also lost some guys to some injury that are coming back, but we don't know necessarily the the time frame. You got Jordan Strawn, who's a a edge rusher that is a guy that could be a big leader for them. He was he was lost, I think, the week before the the Georgia game this year, and then Mo Kaba, I think, went down in that in that Georgia game. He should be back, but they don't know the timetable as well. So if those guys can come back and be close to what they were before the injury, that would be a big boost for them. They're looking at at a linebacker, uh, you know, to kind of step up in the middle there, whether it's, um, you know, De Debo Williams, whether it's Stone Blanton. These are guys that they're that they're looking to step up and and compete because they've got guys that they lost like Sherrod Green and Brad Johnson that have gone, uh, gone on. So in the middle is where you have to be strong, right? And, and uh, you know, it's going to be incumbent upon can Mo Kaba recover and can Debo Williams and Stone Blanton kind of step up into bigger roles for South Carolina defensively. By the way, I meant to mention this at the beginning, and my apologies. We're doing this in mid-February, so – their transfers, injuries, or whatever don't hold it against us because a um, lot, lot of moving parts in college football Absolutely. that haven't happened yet, I'm sure. But Before the, the second wave, before the second wave of transfer oh. portal, uh, you know, because we've had the first one kind of go through in January, but as we've noted, Shane Beamer is not opposed to hitting that portal, Chris, uh, and he'll hit it hard. Yeah, well, so if there's to. talent out there after spring ball, don't, don't be shocked if he goes out and gets it. All right, schedules. Looking over my shoulder here. South Carolina opens with North Carolina, then Furman, then a road trip to Georgia, then Mississippi State, then Tennessee. That's a pretty tough start there, that five. Uh, just that alone, let's let's hit that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, the 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 North Carolina deal always, you know, cross state line battle there and that's something that you know it's going to be technically neutral side in in charlotte but i'd I expect to see a lot of baby blue now i know there'll be a lot of a lot of uh, garnet and and black there as, as well but uh i really really think that you know this is a big year for mac brown and company up there a lot of pressure uh quarterback coming back things of that nature so we'll see see how that one starts off right off the bat and then you know, you don't want to you don't want to jinx anything and just say it's going to be a kick because Furman always plays people. They always play people tough. They're they're a good quality program tradition, but they should handle that one. And then, of course, at Georgia, I think what you want to see if you're Shane Beamer going into that one, Chris, is you want to see growth, right? Where where does Georgia stand? You know, Georgia's the kind of the the 
lead of the division. Where does South Carolina stand in the lead of it? And then, of course, um, Mississippi State and then at Tennessee, who will be looking for retribution, to say the least. All right, back half of the schedule after the bye week. Florida at Missouri at A&M, Jacksonville State, Vandy, Kentucky, Clemson. Let's not forget, Carolina's closed really strong the last couple of years. Um, we'll have confidence it can play with Clemson, obviously, yeah. after what happened a year ago in Death Valley. Um, Vanderbilt hadn't beaten Carolina since I think the, the first Bush was president almost. Um, <laughs> it's been a minute. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it sets up nicely for them to close strong again, I would think. It does. Uh, I will say this: getting Kentucky at home, I think, is is a is a positive because um, I do I do like what that Kentucky program is going to be with the additions of of Devin Leary and Ray Davis and some of the guys that they brought in over there. What stands out to me, Chris, is just man, this is not an easy schedule when you look at the away games. We mentioned Georgia earlier. We mentioned at Tennessee, at Missouri, especially if that is eleven o'clock you know, kickoff, uh, early kickoff like that, those are always tough. And then you follow it up by going at Texas a and I know people are going to say, well, you know, look what Texas A&M has done the last couple of years. This is a huge pressure-packed year for A&M, so that is going to be quite interesting as well. But, yeah, you got to love being able to finish with four straight home games and getting uh, Clemson on your home turf there in Columbia. So, you know, that is a, that's going to be an interesting – uh, interesting finish and uh, those road games in the middle stretch there from from Georgia all the way to Texas A&M. That's where the season is going to be really uh, won or lost, and in my opinion, for South Carolina. Yeah, I did a little double take on their schedule. That's what I was looking up here because uh, I'm thinking, wait a minute, they got Furman and Jacksonville State. That is correct. Now, Jacksonville yeah. State not always a pushover. Ole Miss has found that out before. But I Florida think- State as well a couple years ago. <laughs> Oh, that's that's right. Oh, the, uh, the Hail Mary they beat, at the they end. Beat Florida or, State. <laughs> I think Jacksonville State is going this first year in Division One. Is it's got to be or not Division One in in F FBS? It's the battle of the Gamecocks. Is all I know. Who's going to be the real Gamecock there? Because both of them are the <laughs> Gamecocks. Oh, that's right. Yeah, battle of the Gamecocks. Well, how do we see this shape it up? I mean, no reason to me Carolina can't get bowl eligible again. Um, a lot of swing games in there. Kind of hard to know before the the, the last part of the portal hits. Yeah. But, hey, what we've seen to Shane Beamer in two years and what he took over, what he's done, two things. Don't bet against him getting them bowl eligible. Don't bet against them finishing November really strong. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. With the, the question, I think the question games, because that environment – the home environment that South Carolina has, in my opinion, when uh, you know, when it's getting going with those towels and sandstorm and things like that, it's hard to beat in the in the SEC, and especially if they're playing well. So I think you just really got to circle those road games: Georgia, Tennessee, Missouri, Texas A and M. Those are four games that you know you really, uh, if you can, if you can win, you know. Definitely two of them, maybe three of them. Then you're talking about a, a special, special season because I think I think South Carolina will get things done at Williams Bryce at home uh, this year, and and it, like you said, it, it goes favorable for them towards the end of the year with having some of those those big games at home. So I think you're looking for that next step. So you're looking, can you get to nine, ten wins uh, for South Carolina? That's definitely got to be the goal and the mindset. I think bowl eligibility will will be the least of their worries they're they're trying to take that next step we'll have your program covered if we haven't covered it already we're doing all 14 sec teams a year from now we'll be doing 16 sec teams anyway best way to catch our stuff is hit that subscribe button hit the like button both those things help us tremendously Anyway, thank you for watching our preview of the South Carolina Gamecocks at Southeastern 14. We got baseball stuff coming up. We got basketball stuff. In fact, if you're a Carolina fan, we interviewed your baseball coach, Mark Kingston. Terrific interview. Good stuff. So be sure to check that out as well. Anyway, thank you for watching. We'll see you again soon at Southeastern 14.